wow, these summer crowds look thin. <laughs> I'm trusting that, as Jeremy's already said, that everyone's having a good summer. Uh, we're glad to have the campers back with us from last week. Have you ever noticed that those who think that they are the busiest people still always have time to tell you exactly how busy they are? Poet Christian Wyman wrote this in one of his essays. Ask anyone how they're doing these days and the most frequent re response will be some form of busy or tired. We all feel that there's somehow less time than there once was to satisfy the feverish need we have to fill every hour of every day with measurable tasks and accomplishments. Are you feeling the tension from that? Now, on the flip side of that, though, there is this frustration we experience when the work we do manage to, with, with the work that we do manage to get done. The preacher of Ecclesiastes certainly experienced both of these things. And like many of us, he suffered from the curse of work. Now, some of you have been out of town because of summer and other things, so let me just, let me just review for just a second because we're in our fourth week of this study of the book of Ecclesiastes. And in this book, the preacher, we're assuming that to be Solomon, he set out on a quest. He set out on a headlong pursuit to discover what the meaning of life was or is. And he tried finding it, first of all, in knowledge. And his pursuit of knowledge resulted in this, chapter 1 and verse 28. Bring that up, please. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. I said verse 28, sorry, 118. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. And so he decided to pursue the fulfillment or the meaning of life in things, in uh, the pleasures of the flesh. This is what the result of that was, chapter 2 and verse 11. Everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. And so today we're going to see what happened when he tried to find the meaning of life in his work. Now, many people today, especially in the Western world, have come to expect work to be that which brings them fulfillment in life. Now, as with other things that the preacher has already talked about, though, they're not necessarily bad in and of themselves. Those things that he pursued, for the most part, there's good in them. There's some kind of joy that comes in them, but in them is not found the meaning of life. And the same thing is true with work. So let's hear what he has to say about that, chapter 2 and verse 17. So I hated life because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And so here's the picture. We spend our whole lives trying to accomplish something, trying to amass a fortune, but as they say, you can't take it with you. Or as George Strait put it in his song, You'll Be There, you don't bring nothing with you here and you can't take nothing back. I ain't never seen a hearse with a luggage rack. Now, if you're lucky, the one that you leave everything to is going to do well with it. But then again, maybe not. And so he says in verse 19, and who knows whether that person will be wise or foolish, yet they will have control over all the fruit of my toil into which I poured my effort and skill into the sun. This too is meaningless. And so the question hangs, who knows what's going to happen? Who knows what's going to happen with that which I have 
amassed. And then he even offers a worst case scenario in verse 20. When he says, so my heart began to despair over all my toilsome labor under the sun. For a person may labor with wisdom, knowledge, and skill. And then they must leave all they own to another who has not toiled for it. This too is meaningless and a great misfortune. And something in us, as we read that, something in us shouts, There's, this is not fair. It's not fair that that's the way life is. And how well the preacher, again, assuming it's Solomon, how well he knew this. You know, Solomon was one of the most successful businessmen of his time. He amassed a huge fortune. And he left that huge fortune to his eldest son, Rehoboam. And within a very short time, you know what happened? Rehoboam had lost 80% of the kingdom that Solomon had built. Check me out on that, 1 Kings chapter 12. This is one of the great frustrations for all who are focused under the sun. We, we have this deep longing to make something of ourselves. We have this deep longing to do something that will last. But the under the sun reality is this, we can't keep it. Woody Allen, who seems to be obsessed with death, a number of things he said have something to do with death. And he once said this, I don't want to achieve immortality through my work. I want to achieve or immortality by not dying. <laughs> well, leaving it all behind is bad enough. But another serious problem with work is the work itself. He speaks to this in the next verses. What do people get for all the toil and anxious striving with which they labor under the sun? All their days, their work is grief and pain. Even at night, their minds do not rest. This too is meaningless. You see, whether we work long, hard hours outside under the sun or whether we work at a desk job where we have a lot of mental stress, our work takes a toll on us, doesn't it? As one translation puts it in this verse, there's too much strain without much gain. Think about the worry that work brings us. After a hard day of work, there's nothing we want much better, much more than to be able to go home and get a good night's rest, right? But oftentimes, what do we do? Well, we can't sleep because we're worried about, we're consumed with, we're obsessed with what's going to happen tomorrow. What do I have to do tomorrow? What's the next project? When's it due? And the preacher concludes that from beginning to end, life is a weary labor with nothing to show for it. If we make work our life, if we make work that which we are expecting to give meaning and purpose to our lives, it's going to leave us empty. One night when Beverly was out of town on one of her uh, retreats that she does, I came across a movie that was being shown on one of the stations, you know, where they edit and all that stuff, probably TBS. Uh, it was an old movie from 2002 entitled About Schmidt. Uh, it starred Jack Nicholson. And in this movie, he is a guy that's just retired from being an actuary for an Omaha insurance company. And he's really struggling with trying to find the meaning of life. What have I accomplished with my life? His wife dies during this time, and it throws him into even more of a tailspin. And, and, and so he's just, he, he's trying so hard to, to find out, as he looks back over his life, I have nothing to show for it. Well, he decides during this time that he's going to start, start supporting a child in Africa. And he writes this child a letter. It's, it's 
humorous if it wasn't so sad because he just pours out everything to this child living in a third world country. And here's what he says. I know we're all pretty small in the big scheme of things and I suppose the most you can hope for is to make some kind of difference. But what kind of difference have I made? What in the world is better because of me? Once I'm dead and everyone who knows me dies too, it'll be as though I never even existed. What difference has my life made to anyone? None that I can think of, none at all. Hope things are fine with you. <laughs> Yours truly, Warren Smith. He soon discovered right after that he got a letter from the agency that said this boy doesn't read or speak English. So, <laughs> you know, it accomplished nothing sending this letter. Uh, but it's a question for all of us to consider. What kind of difference have I made with my life? It's kind of sobering, isn't it? Well, nothing prepares us for what happens next. Because right when the preacher has us to a point where we're just about ready to jump out of a 10-story window, this book takes a surprising turn. Up to this point, he's been, as described by the Old Testament scholar Gerhard von Rad, He's been a bitter skeptic suspended over the abyss of despair. But suddenly and without warning, the preacher turns positive and he says this. A person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. This too I see is from the hand of God for without him who can eat or find enjoyment? Now, this is a turning point in the book of Ecclesiastes. Martin Luther, in his commentary on Ecclesiastes, called this a remarkable passage, one that explains everything preceding and following it. In other words, Martin Luther and others think that this is the point of the whole book, this verse right here. Now, there are those who disagree. There are some scholars who say that the words, there is nothing better, uh, express only a grudging appreciation for this. As if the preacher's saying, it isn't much, but I'll toss you this bone. At least life can offer us this. Now, if that's true, then the preacher's basically falling back on the old philosophy of Epicureanism. Carpe diem, seize the day. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. I will tell you this. The Apostle Paul basically says, you take Jesus out of the equation and you might as well live the Epicurean philosophy. That's right, that's what Paul says. Look at this, 1 Corinthians 15. If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. But I happen to believe that the preacher is being more positive than simply that. This is the first of his enjoyment passages as they're called and we'll see a number of them in the book of Ecclesiastes he's not giving in to despair here rather he's beginning to see the difference that life the difference made in a life when God is in the center of that life I want you to notice uh, I'm sorry Kyle would you put that verse back up there no I'm sorry go back one more Okay, I want you to notice the way this is worded right here. Because what Solomon is doing here is he's not seizing something for himself. What he is now doing is opening his hands to receive that which comes from God. You see the difference? And so 
his message isn't simply the meaningless of life under the sun, but also the joy that comes from the hand of God. And you're reading it imbalanced if you read the book of Ecclesiastes from either one of these extremes. If you read it from the meaningless of life or if you read it simply from receiving joy from the hand of God, you're reading it wrong. He says both of them and sometimes he says both of them in the same passage. This paradox reminds me of, a, of an old cartoon. I don't know if you can see what's written under this, but it says, I wish you would make up your mind, Mr. Dickens. Was it the best of times or was it the worst of times? It could scarcely have been both. Well, you know the truth of the matter? It often is both, isn't it? Life is often the best of times and the worst of times. There's a bittersweet balance in life. Why? Well, for one reason, we live in a world that is broken by sin. But at the same time, we live in a world that God created and said is good. A world that God came in the flesh, stepped into, and walked through with us. A world in which God says, I'm not leaving it broken, I'm going to fix it. I'm going to make it right. Notice again and notice this carefully, verse 24. A person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. This too I see is from the hand of God. The preacher mentions some of the very activities that he had pursued that we looked at last week, eating and drinking. He mentions them again. Last week he said, this is meaningless. This is not where the meaning of life is found. And yet now he brings them up again in a different context. Where they didn't bring him gain last week, now he seems to find purpose for them. What makes the difference? God. God makes the difference. Up to this point, God has hardly been mentioned in this book. The one time God has been mentioned, he's part of the problem. Look back at chapter 1 and verse 13. What a heavy burden God has laid on mankind. But here, God's presence makes all the difference. The preacher is saying, that no one can ever find any true joy in anything apart from God. And so if you're having trouble, listen, it's time for a reality check here. If you are having trouble finding joy and finding enjoyment and finding peace in this life, God's not at the center. Is that too harsh? If you find yourself deeply dissatisfied with life, this could be the reason why. You see, we often take what is good, we often take that and make it the ultimate thing. When in fact, it is a God-given thing. And this eating and drinking that the preacher enjoys comes directly from the hand of God. The preacher has stopped trying to seize pleasure for himself on his own and now he has simply opened his hands up to receive what God gives him as a blessing. Look at chapter 3 and verse 13 that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. Here's a basic biblical principle that we can apply to many situations in life. It's a summary verse that Paul writes for us in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 4. Listen to this. For everything God created is good. What does everything mean? Everything. For everything God created is good. 
and nothing is to be rejected. Now, this is a big two-letter word right here. And nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God in prayer. Earthly pleasures then are what? They are a gift from God. But even they have their limits. They never give us eternal satisfaction. They are not that which brings the meaning of life. Ray Steadman in his book, Is This All There Is to Life? says this. Isn't it strange that the more you run after life, panting after every pleasure, the less you find? But the more you take life as a gift from God's hand, responding in thankful gratitude for the delight of the moment, the more that seems to come to you. In the words of Beverly Ross, truth. This is truth. And so Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Every work, every job that we have in this room, everything is a gift from God. It's something that we receive from his hand. Sometimes I think when we, when we, when we think about the Old Testament, we mistakenly think that before the fall, Adam and Eve were basically at what you might call a all-inclusive resort. That all they did is just sit around and they're waited on and the food's given to them. They're just lying out in the sun all day long by the pool. Do you know that's not the case? Before the fall, God gave them work. He gave them hard work. Look at what it says here. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And for those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, whatever job you have, the way God intends it is that you are working for him, that you are working for his kingdom. To say this another way, we are working under the S-O-N, not just working under the S-U-N. Everything we're doing, we're working under the Son, Jesus Christ. And so Colossians 3 and verse 23 says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. And so back to the issue that we began with this morning. What does the worker gain from all of his or her work? To the person who pleases him, God gives wisdom knowledge and happiness but to the sinner he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God this too is meaningless a chasing after the wind here the preacher makes a very clear distinction between two kinds of people on the one hand there's those who please God and those who please God are described as grateful recipients of wisdom and knowledge and joy. If we live for God's pleasure, he is going to richly reward us with all of the spiritual blessings that he longs to give his people. But for the sinner, there's no reward. Because the sinner refuses to acknowledge that what he has or what she has comes from God. It's a life that's dominated by acquisition. It's a life that's dominated by accumulation of consumer goods, all of which is going to eventually be left behind. And this, too, is meaningless. Now, admittedly, that's not always the way things happen, is it? Because every one of us in this room know of righteous people who have suffered greatly. 
and all of us have known about wicked people who seem to be rewarded in this life. But it will not always be this way. Because at the culmination of the ages, the meek will inherit the earth. So says Jesus in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 5. And so the preacher invites us to see every moment as the means by which God pursues us among the simple, among what sometimes might seem to us to be mundane things in life. To those who have a nihilistic outlook on life, they shout, but we're all going to die. To which the preacher, now at this point in this book, would say, yeah, you're right. So throw another steak on the grill. Many shout today especially, the sky's falling. Oh, everything's so terrible. The sky's just falling. The preacher would say, yep, it is. Hey, kick back and have a glass of tea. God's still here. We push back against that, though, don't we? We push back against it, and we say, but everything is meaningless. There's, there's injustice in this broken world. And he would say, you're right. Hey, why don't you go take a nice, warm bath? Because God isn't done yet. Well, what do you mean? Nothing satisfies us. Everything is meaningless. I know. You're right. So listen to your wife's voice and hold her hand. And do the dishes together and, and make plans for your life together and enjoy her just like you enjoyed her when you first met her. Because God is here. And these are some of the simple blessings that he gives you to enjoy. And so the conclusion is this. God has given us good work to do. And so let us do that good work, knowing that Jesus has already done the hard work of securing salvation for you and me. Let me sum it up with this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58 says, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. We're getting ready to sing this song for an invitation song. It's entitled, I'm Mine No More. I'm Mine No More. I've been bought with blood I'm mine no more and we'd love to pray for you if you have a, a, something working in your life maybe something that relates to our lesson this morning job related or your frustrations with life in general hey come forward and express that we'll have an elder and his wife in room 102 to, to assist you there if you'd like to pray with them I'd really like to see anyone here today that doesn't yet know Jesus Christ and hasn't been buried with him in baptism, love to see you come and make that your decision today to walk with him. We want to stand and sing this song, I Mind No More, and let that be a song to encourage you. Let's stand together. Uh -huh.